in our language we would say uh, uh, the water is sick it's, it's hurting uh, the temperatures in the water is not cold anymore it is telling us something like the temperature in our body and our veins uh, when you're sick when we are sick then our temperature raises too and then it allows all the other warm water fish to grow in abundance good water for them but it makes bad water to the giver of life to the Indian people and when it has cold water it takes care of the salmon because those are cold water fish and that's that gives life to us the water in the Columbia River Basin is not taking care of salmon. The water is so sick that many salmon stocks have already gone extinct. Some are on the endangered species list, and most others are in decline. When the United States signed treaties with the tribes and bands living in the Columbia Plateau in 1855, it created a special kind of obligation to them. That obligation is called a trust responsibility. The United States made a solemn promise that tribes would forever be able to exercise their sovereign rights to use the natural resources now threatened with extinction. Honoring that promise is a matter of trust. Supreme Court Justice Black said that uh, um, great nations like great men should keep their word. So uh, the treaty had said that a certain lifestyle was to be maintained um, for the tribes and that the United States uh, under the trust responsibility that was laid out in that uh, contract or the treaty is that they're to work with us to help protect those and not give those away for other benefits to other people. I think the federal government has to recognize their responsibility as quote trustees to the tribes and that includes the Forest Service. That includes the Corps of Engineers who built these dams. That includes Bonneville Power Administration. You know, the list goes on. Each of these federal agencies have a trust responsibility to protect these resources for the tribe. And what that means is that they've got to uh, protect and recognize uh, the rights to fish, and the, and the, the right to have those fish in, in the streams. They have not upheld their responsibility because when the tribes signed treaties, we ceded thousands and millions of acres of land and they have not kept their part of the bargain. When tribal leaders signed the treaties, they signed over title to their territory. However, that title is perpetually and irrevocably encumbered by treaty promises the United States made to the Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce people. Commitments the federal government made on behalf of its citizens are in effect liens on the property it acquired, which limit how the land and its resources can be used. All federal agencies, an arm of the United States government, have fiduciary obligations to, uh, uh, to recognize the trust responsibility to the indigenous people through the treaties that we have. But it is hard for many of these agencies to recognize that or realize it based on the fact that uh, the terms of a treaty, uh, ceded land, uh, tribal governments, sovereign nations, has never been taught in the education curriculums or institutions across this country. And so people today uh, are operating under the logic of the uninformed yet. We uphold our half the contract Sometimes we have to uphold the United States as half also. The four tribes recognize that the federal government has consistently failed to develop natural resource allocation policies and plans that meet even the minimum requirements of its treaty promises. And that's why the tribes have developed their own restoration plan. The plan, like Konishmi Wakishwit, Spirit of the Salmon, incorporates a process known as adaptive management. This approach enables us to begin salmon restoration efforts in earnest, even in the face of uncertainty. It allows us to learn from our actions by carefully monitoring and evaluating the results, then making adjustments. The conceptual framework for Waikonishmi Wakishwit is the salmon's own life cycle. 
which begins in a freshwater stream, includes a migration down the Columbia River to the Pacific Ocean where the salmon grows and matures, followed by a return trip to the stream of its origin to start the cycle again. And just as the United States has a trust responsibility to the tribes, the tribes have a trust responsibility of sorts to the salmon to perpetuate that cycle. The reason we need to look at the big picture is that everybody has a responsibility to save these fish. These, these fish aren't, aren't man-made fish. These fish are made by a power higher than us, and they're, they're ancient, millions of years old. And I think it's only morals that, a uh, moral thing with me to say, to save them and increase their stocks. Not only is a treaty right there, but I think it's the moral thing to do. When I was young and raised in Catholic schools, the idea of communists coming in and taking our sacramental bread and sacramental wine and throwing it on the altar was the absolute sacrilege. And it was the kind of scare that was thrown into us by nuns who were saying, this is, this is what can happen to your sacraments. But we've done the same thing to Indian sacraments. Salmon are a giver of life themselves. They're a giver of sustenance, of, of nutrition. They go all the way out to the ocean. They take all of these nutrients out of the ocean and they bring them back to the stream. They supply those nutrients not only to human beings as food, but also to, to other animals, to other insect life, to uh, a whole series of, of vertebrates and invertebrates that are, that are the source of our ecosystems, that are, that are the basis for our ecosystems. You can't have a salmon stream without salmon. Waikonishmi Wakishwit is an example of ecosystem management, or what the tribes have always called gravel-to-gravel -gravel management. It's a blend of both the best available science and the cultural values that have sustained their ancestors for thousands of years. Tribal science invested just in exactly that. We call it cultural science. It's based upon a need traditionally, culturally, religiously, and in health-wise. The Tribal Recovery Plan is a, is a, a collection, a, a collective idea of recovery based upon good habitat, based upon cultural nuances, uh, treaty law that is standardized and strengthened and is ongoing and always looking to achieve to a goal. In order for Waikonishmi Wakishwit to be effective, the tribes need widespread public support. We need the cooperation not only of the states, the federal government itself, but especially uh, we need the uh, advocacy of the local people, uh, meaning uh, county governments, uh, right down to the individual uh, landowner themselves or the individual that is part of the population here in the, in the Northwest. We as citizens of this particular area are all responsible and accountable to, to the devastation of the anadromous fish population. When salmon spawn, digging nests and laying eggs, they complete their life cycle. Soon after, they will die. But if we humans manage ourselves properly, those eggs will grow to become the next generation of salmon. Salmon have distinct, easily defined freshwater ecosystem requirements, which are widely known and can be stated simply. Even though there's tremendous variation in conditions throughout the Columbia Basin and Snake River spawning and rearing habitats, what the fish need is basically the same from basin to basin. They need cool water, they need clean channel substrate, that is the rocks that line the bottoms of the streams. They need them to be free from mud. They need abundant large wood in the streams. Those are important for forming pools and creating complex habitats where the fish can hide, where they can feed, where adults can rest. They need well-shaded systems. They need very stable banks. And those requirements have been known for a long time. Even though we know what salmon need, healthy freshwater ecosystems are in short supply throughout the Columbia Basin. The Yakima Basin is uh, basically an, an ecological disaster, but let me put that in context. It suffered from 
historical overgrazing conditions in its headwaters and upper ranges. It suffered from uncontrolled logging operations in the uplands. It suffered from irrigation withdrawal in the lowlands. And yet, in context, it is still one of those drainage basins that could be saved. It's uh, just a textbook example of what has happened throughout the Columbia Basin where for the sake of progress or economic development, uh, resources were developed with little thought to the future and essentially the Salmonids in this basin paid the bill. The Yakima watershed is one of the most intensely irrigated in the nation. Pesticide and herbicide use remains a very large problem. The water that is used to run over the land to irrigate our crops is also utilized as a, as a vehicle to apply chemicals. Various fertilizers are then uh, placed back into the return flows. And as we know, water being the supreme recyclable commodity, all water is, every drop is recycled. That pollution, the silting and the chemicals are all introduced and then adds to the pollution, adds to the to the problem of the fisheries and the degradation of the, uh, of the environment. The water quality has degraded considerably in the last 40 years to a point where you can't drink the water and how the fish survive in it uh, is a miracle. Throughout this whole basin, the water quality is very poor. While the lower Yakima suffers the most serious water quality problems, in the upper part of the basin, Tributaries such as the Tianaway River suffer more from lack of water, which is caused by diversion for irrigation. The Tianaway under natural conditions would have considerably more water in it than, than what you're looking at. Uh, and the Tianaway was an important uh, uh, anatomous fish producer. We had runs uh, historically of Spring Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead in the Tianaway. And as you can see now, uh, uh, right around us, it would be impossible for any fish, any adult fish, to uh, come up the Tianaway River and spawn. Uh, and they are totally blocked from utilization of the Tianaway, even though there is uh, considerable uh, spawning and rearing habitat above this point. Below this point, uh, about all that's going down river is what leaks through this gravel berm. In combination with other problems in the Columbia River system, the impact of all this development on the Yakima watershed salmon stocks has been devastating. We used to have runs estimated at uh, 500,000 to 900,000 returning adults annually of six different runs. Uh, and today, three of those are extinct. That is the coho, uh, the summer chinook, uh, and the uh, sockeye. We have remnant runs of spring chinook, fall chinook, and uh, steelhead. These runs are in real trouble in the Yakima Basin. While the Yakima watershed is perhaps the most obvious example of the problems that result from excessive irrigation, Similar problems exist in many Columbia River tributary watersheds. The Umatilla River, which runs through the Umatilla Reservation, is plagued by an illegal practice known as water spreading. Water spreading is the act of using water that is delivered by the Bureau of Reclamation Dam and Irrigation System outside of the authorized boundaries of an irrigation district. The Bureau of Reclamation has known about this problem for a long time and probably has even encouraged it by taking that water out of the river and destroying the, the salmon resource that the tribes uh, had a treaty right to. Um, they were basically abrogating their trust responsibility to us. Watersheds throughout the Columbia River Basin also suffer extensively from poor mining, logging, and grazing practices. Though most mining is historic, its impacts persist. In many tributaries, dredges removed countless miles of stream bed in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho in the pursuit of gold. Dredge mining sent enormous volumes of silt downstream, affecting even stream reaches that weren't mined. Piled along banks, these dredge spoils have prevented shade-producing, bank-stabilizing vegetation from taking hold, in some cases for as long as 90 years. Logging and the road building that goes along with it can be equally devastating to stream ecosystems. As soil, once held in place by trees, erodes, it buries the gravel salmon use for building their nests. Logging near streams also removes sources of large woody debris 
that help to create complex combinations of pools, riffles, and stream channels where adults rest and juveniles hide and feed. Tall trees help to keep the temperatures cooler in summer and warmer in winter. Cattle trample stream banks and eat away the bank stabilizing vegetation. Intensive cattle grazing also compacts nearby soils, making them more prone to erosion and less able to absorb precipitation. The result of all these activities is to change natural stream contours, to upset natural seasonal flow patterns, and to subvert the way a stream naturally interacts with the land around it. Some attempts have been made to repair degraded watersheds. Unfortunately, most have failed. This is Deer Creek. It's a tributary to the South Fork of the John Day River. This creek is, uh, oddly enough, considered to be one of the best steelhead streams in this part of the forest. Uh, this wood structure back here is part of a BPA enhancement project that the Forest Service worked jointly on putting this in together. The idea was to boost steelhead production. Uh, it's created this pool here, but I don't think anybody would guess that this has increased fish production. The unfortunate situation we have here is cattle grazing has continued at a very high intensity. The cows are coming down and they're using this basically as a stock pond, as a watering hole. There are a few steelhead smolts floating around in this pool. They're the only fish I've found and they're dead. Part of the problem here is that and this is something that we see throughout the Columbia Basin, is you can't boost fish production or increase fish survival by just sticking sticks like this in here, because it only treats the symptoms. It doesn't do anything to take care of the cause of the problem, which is cattle grazing. We've got bare banks back here. We've got almost no vegetation. The water temperatures are high. There's nothing happening here that's any good for fish. This is a tremendous waste of money, and the ratepayers, the Bonneville Power Administration, has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars within this very drainage to do activities like this. Less than 2% of the co total cattle production in the West is produced on public lands like this. And it's exerting a terrible and catastrophic toll on the fisheries. Even though it may take up to 300 years for complete restoration, Earth can, under some circumstances, begin to heal itself quickly. This is a section of the South Fork of Murderer's Creek in the John Day watershed. For about the last 15 years, it's been fenced to prevent cattle from intruding. It's called an exclosure. Willows and grasses have reestablished themselves beside the creek. As a result, the water is beginning to run deeper and cooler. We can restore much of the salmon's productive capacity by restoring freshwater ecosystems. The actions called for in Waikonishmi Wakishwit will allow us to put salmon back in these rivers and streams. These, in general, are the prescriptions. Reduce the amount of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers that we use. Leave enough water in streams so that salmon can spawn, rear, and migrate. Create buffer strips within riparian zones where no land-disturbing activities are allowed. Fence cattle away from stream banks. Screen all irrigation diversions. Stop illegal water spreading. At a certain point in their young lives, salmon make the journey from their natal streams down the Columbia River and to the Pacific Ocean. At a certain point, late in their lives, they return. In order to make those journeys, salmon now have to survive the effects of huge upriver storage projects, reservoirs behind hydroelectric dams, and the dams themselves. The fact is, you put a barrier, a physical barrier, across the river. Um, and then the fish have a hard time getting over. We build ladders that, what do we call, mitigate or allow a certain number of them to go over. When they're finally able to successfully spawn, finally able to procreate, follow the order, their offspring then have the same gauntlet in reverse to run going down the river, uh, whether it's the actual physical barrier of the dam itself or by the temperature degradation to the impoundments. Blocked by natural barriers, 
Part of the Columbia Basin was never available to salmon for spawning and rearing. But Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia and Hell's Canyon Dam on the Snake prevent salmon from reaching about one-third of their historic habitat. Altogether, dams that salmon can't get past have eliminated about half of their former spawning grounds. In the habitat that remains, salmon who rear above Wells Dam must pass nine dams during their migration. Those who rear above lower granite on the Snake must survive the effects of eight dams. In some years, up to 98% will perish before they reach the ocean. On average, turbines are estimated to directly kill as many as 15% of those that pass through them at each dam. But delayed effects on many of those who survive turbine passage may make the toll considerably higher. There's been some research done on Atlantic salmon that seems to indicate uh, as fish go through, they actually suffer brain and, and muscle lesions from passage through turbines, which causes a delayed mortality uh, you know, later on as those fish go downstream. On the other hand, passage of smolts through the, the spillway section, through numerous studies, determined we're somewhere in the neighborhood of zero to three percent mortality through that route. So there's one other route, and that's through the various bypass systems. Uh, not all the dams on the river have them, and they're very individual in terms of, of what we're seeing of mortality through those systems. Somewhere in the neighborhood of, of roughly a large range of anywhere from about 2% uh, all the way up to 20% uh, if the water quality conditions are bad. Because water is held in huge storage reservoirs in Canada and in the upper parts of the Columbia and Snake River basins in the United States, Young salmon are no longer swept to the ocean on swift currents as the snow melts in the spring. That water is held back for irrigation in summer and power production in the winter when demand for electricity is high. And the hydropower dams themselves have transformed the free-flowing, high-velocity rivers into hundreds of miles of slack water ponds, extending the downstream migration for some salmon from two weeks to two months. During that extra time in the river, Water temperatures sometimes rise to levels that are deadly to salmon. Higher temperatures also make salmon more prone to disease and stress. The longer stay exposes them to their natural predators, both birds and other fish, for longer periods of time. The results have been disastrous for salmon stock. The federal government's principal strategy for combating the losses attributable to the hydro system has been transportation, taking young salmon out of the river putting them in barges and trucks, then releasing them below Bonneville Dam. Barging is, is, was th always thought is, is somewhat of a, of a way out to, to you know, essentially take the fish out of the river and so they don't have to deal with low flow and, and poor water quality conditions. But, but it's not a panacea. We've got to get the river back uh, to a healthier state if we're going to recover our, our salmon populations. The tribes, among others, have recommended several alternatives to make the river safer for juvenile salmon. One objective of those proposals is to get the water moving faster. Faster water means young fish move downstream more quickly, and a quicker journey means higher survival rates. One way to increase water velocity is to draw down some of the reservoirs. Two alternatives are being considered. One is to draw them down about halfway. It's called spillway crest drawdown. The other is called the natural river option. In effect, what that means is, is opening up the dam down at its bottom, each dam down near the bottom, putting in gates that would uh, allow uh, the water to be drawn down all the way so that in essence, the natural flows occur through the dam. Uh, once you get the cross-sectional area down to a natural river amount, it doesn't take very high flows to create the velocities necessary to move the fish. The tribes recommend the following measures in order to improve survival of migrating juvenile and adult salmon. Manage water flow regimes to recreate the natural runoff patterns during migration. Operate turbines within 1% of their peak efficiency. Modify or replace existing turbines with technology that reduces salmon mortality. In the short term, spill water at projects to get 80% of the outmigrating juveniles past the dams 
without going through the turbines. In the longer term, keep 90% out of the turbines. To restore a more natural population balance, continue intensive removal of big mouth minnows which prey on juvenile salmon. Begin a series of reservoir drawdowns, including some combination of the Lower Snake River dams and John Day Dam. Salmon spend between one and five years in the ocean where they feed, grow, and mature. Before the arrival of non-Indians, about 5% of all the juveniles that left their natal streams returned to spawn as adults. Now that rate has fallen to less than 1% for runs originating above Bonneville Dam. Before the arrival of non-Indians, it is estimated that tribes in the Columbia Basin harvested as many as 5 million salmon each year and they did not deplete the runs. Our people lived by the traditional law. They made the laws to how you can handle, how you must manage the salmon. And they lived that way as long as I could remember. Our people knew just when to allow from the fish traps, when to allow from the weirs or from whatever other methods they were using, including dip netting, to seize uh, fishing activities to allow enough salmon or enough fish to return to the upper streams. In other words, uh, let them pass through. They, they had the common sense of practicing that as conservationists. But non-Indians who arrived in the mid-1800s fished without regard for conservation, which led to regulation and harvest restrictions. While harvest restrictions are important, it has become abundantly clear that harvest restrictions alone are not enough to protect dwindling salmon runs. Summer Chinook have not been harvested in over three decades, spring Chinook in over two decades, and they have not recovered by themselves during that time period, which indicates that there needs to be other measures. Harvest restrictions have been disproportionately imposed on in-river fishers. Even among harvesters, in-river fisheries have the least impact but are the most regulated. When those fish go out into the ocean, uh, they're being harvested at high rates in the ocean. We need to uh, restrict ocean harvest rates in, off the coast of Washington, Oregon, and California, which have re been restricted pretty much, and more importantly, Canada and Alaska. Those fisheries have to be restricted. I believe we need to have a better look and reconsideration of the U.S.-Canada agreement. Uh, one of the things that has flared up uh, after the agreement from the Pacific Salmon Treaty is the fact of the incidental catches, where they have uh, designated fisheries for certain species. Millions are caught, incidentally, of other species. Early sockeye fishery off from uh, uh, West Coast Vancouver Island, they incidentally catch up to about 60% of the fish that's migrating back up to the Columbia River. So the incidental catch rate has, has accelerated beyond reason. While the tribes recognize that harvest is not the major problem in salmon restoration, harvesters do have a share of the conservation burden to shoulder. These are the tribe's recommendations. Reduce the impact on adult Chinook in northern Pacific Ocean fisheries. Reduce incidental take mortalities. Change from fixed harvest ceilings to harvest regimes based on abundance in Pacific Coast Chinook fisheries. Hatcheries have long been recognized as important tools for maintaining and restoring salmon populations throughout the world. Unfortunately, here in the Columbia Basin, they've been misused. Fishery managers and resource decision makers believed hatchery technology could overcome the devastating effects of the huge hydroelectric and storage dams on salmon populations. In 1938, Congress passed the Mitchell Act authorizing construction and operation of a system of hatcheries to mitigate for the impact of federal dams. At the time that the uh, negotiation was made between the Corps and our elders, and I was there listening, when, my, when our leader 
But she spoke and said, you are going to endanger my food by when you construct these dams in this river, that is going to be a danger pretty soon that I will have nothing. And the court said, don't you worry, old man. He told him that you, we are going to provide for hatcheries, something called hatcheries, upstream, up in the Columbia Basin, where the salmon used to go, you were going to provide you with hatcheries up there, and you're going to have more, than, more salmon than you got today. That's, that was the promise that was made. And that's the promise that was never kept. The outcome of the Mitchell Act has been to replace upriver natural production with hatcheries, mostly located below Bonneville Dam, below the tribe's usual and accustomed fishing sites. Existing hatchery practices right now at this point have always served to maintain the status quo at the expense of the tribe's ability to access them and to use them for uh, propagation means you know, to satisfy mitigation. When it became obvious that the four dams on the lower Snake River were seriously affecting salmon populations, Congress approved the Lower Snake River Compensation Plan in 1976. That put some hatcheries in the Snake River above those dams. But by concentrating heavily on steelhead production, it failed to make up for other salmon species impacted by the dams. The Lower Snake River Compensation Plan was a failure. It failed to recognize tribes as managers. It failed to compensate for the species that were lost by the lo four Lower Snake dams. Instead, state and federal agencies developed a compensation plan to meet sportsmen's needs. They wanted spring chinook, steelhead, and a little bit of summers. This plan let, allowed coho chum to go extinct, and our sockeye are virtually extinct. Our spring, our summer, and our fall chinook are on the endangered species list, and our naturally spawning steelhead are in real trouble. Hatcheries in the Columbia Basin, operated by federal and state agencies, produce approximately 200 million juvenile salmon each year. Only about one million now return as adults. Hatchery managers are supervised and they're graded on the amount of fish, pounds of fish they're putting out. Often the hatcheries have put out very poor quality fish and you put them in together You've stressed them and had problems with disease in these, these fish populations, then you've, uh, they've been released. And in many cases, the runs didn't return as a result. Too often, unhealthy hatchery salmon have been released into an unnaturally hostile environment. At the same time, raised under artificial conditions, these fish have been deprived of the opportunity to acquire the survival skills that come from rearing in rivers and streams. For these reasons, salmon reared in hatcheries may lack some of the qualities of wild fish. But that doesn't mean, as some argue, that they are genetically inferior. We've allowed some uh, geneticists, uh, some science, to dictate to us uh, more than we really know through some genetic stock identification methods. We've found out that there's certainly there are some differences between salmon stocks. What it's done is to tie our hands. We, we should be living with adaptive management, and we should be learning by doing, and we should be planting fish out there and letting Mother Nature do its own thing and selecting process. But we've got a little bit of knowledge and it's, and it's uh, paralyzed us as far as our decision-making process. They will spend millions of dollars to keep one or two hatchery fish from spawning with uh, a couple hundred wild fish. That's how crazy it's gotten. I think uh, it's a reflection of, of uh, some mad scientists that have gone awry and they need to come back to, to some common sense and getting fish back in the rivers. I think they'll take care of themselves. Um, we're managing molecules, not fish anymore. So, As salmon stocks continue to dwindle, the risk of extinction is far greater than the risks they face from the carefully controlled use of hatcheries to supplement their populations. Sometimes I feel that we're working in the canals of Mars. In Alaska, hatcheries are used as a means of recovery. In the Puget Sound, hatcheries are used as a means for recovering wild populations. Those populations are, are 
in the hatchery are meant to be the same as what's in the stream so that they can be used for recovery. In Northern California, they're that way. In the Columbia Basin, somehow or another, all of these laws of science that have been developed in these other areas don't matter. Declines of fish runs will never be halted without using supplementation. It has to occur naturally and with hatchery support. For 70 years, no salmon at all returned to the Umatilla River, blocked from their habitat by Three Mile Dam. But the Umatilla tribe reintroduced salmon into that watershed using supplementation hatchery techniques. Returning adults are trapped at the dam, then either released upstream or taken to a small hatchery. We're using hatcheries as a tool to restore salmon population. It's like giving them a boost so that they can get to levels where they can uh, sustain themselves. And it's working right now. The Umatilla Basin Project is one of the supplementation success stories in the Columbia River Basin. It provides a basis for optimism about achieving even larger goals. The production objectives here in the Umatilla, for instance, are 47,000 spawners. That's the goal that everybody's agreed to, the states, the tribes, and the council, power council. And um, so 47,000 uh, of spawners, that would be fall Chinook, spring Chinook, steelhead, and coho, once we a attain that goal through hatcheries, uh, hatchery supplementation, uh, then we're, we're going to be having to move on to other basins. To make appropriate use of hatcheries and artificial propagation, Waikonishmi Wakishwit contains these recommendations use artificial propagation to help rebuild at-risk salmon populations. Use artificial propagation to reintroduce salmon into watersheds from which they have been eliminated. Support ongoing and implement new watershed planning through a Columbia Basin Watershed Trust Program. And transfer some hatcheries located on reservations and other upriver hatcheries to tribal control. For thousands of years, tribes successfully managed salmon and the resources salmon depend upon. In less than 200 years, the non-Indian culture has devastated those same resources. The federal government, on behalf of the nation, played a key role in both encouraging and subsidizing that destruction. It's time for the federal government to reverse the policies and practices that have drained and fouled the basin's waterways and transform the Columbia River into a hostile series of slackwater ponds. On behalf of the nation, the federal government must now address its responsibility and help the tribes lead the non-Indian culture to restoration of and coexistence with the resources of the Columbia River Basin. It is a matter of trust. We already have processes that can help us with salmon restoration, processes defined by the federal courts. The Columbia River Fish Management Plan, a forum for equitable harvest management and salmon production, can serve as a template for our recovery efforts. It's time for all citizens of the Columbia River Basin to join the tribes in a watershed by watershed restoration. It's time for all of us to join together to take care of the resources the Creator put here, to fulfill our obligation not only to children yet unborn, but to the salmon themselves. The water is sick. Together we must begin to make it well. <laughs>